Hi there, really nice to be back here again talking to you at our Nanopole community meeting. I'm going to give you an introduction to the technology, a bit of a sore throat, so I will try and get through all of this. Um, but yeah, please excuse me if you can't hear perfectly. And then I'm going to talk through some of the platform technology improvements we've been making over the last six months. So as you probably know, <coughs> our goal is to enable the analysis of anything by anyone, anywhere. Um, we know this is a, a, a broad, ambitious, and diverse goal, but we also believe those are characteristics of the Nanopore community, and it's that community coming together every six months. We really look forward to seeing what you've been doing on the technology and also updating you on what we've been working on and what's coming down the pipeline. So why Nanopore? Let's start with accuracy. Accuracy is a topic that is discussed a lot on Nanopore, and I think one reason for this is we went out the door um, very early, about eight years ago in an early access program. We knew the accuracy would improve, and we really wanted to improve it in the field, build a community, iterate with you guys, and it really has improved. We've come on leaps and bounds over that time period, and um, probably exceeded the expectations of a lot of people. Now, for the real Nanopore enthusiasts, that gr that's great. They get to see everything changing kind of in real time. But for those people that just dip in and out of Nanopore, it can perhaps be a little bit confusing. Um, we talk about our track record, and we have a great track record of delivering accuracy improvements. And we also talk about our um, technology's headroom. And we still believe that there is plenty in the technology to get out plenty more in the signal for us to improve the accuracy further. But one of those things is in the past, and one of those is in the future. And what I'd really like to draw your attention to right now is what we have right now. Because in the end, that's all we've really got is right now. And right now, nanopore accuracy is very, very good. So single molecule accuracy, I can take an adaptive piece of DNA, let's say something short, like 1,000 bases, and I can pass that through a nanopore. And it will take three to four seconds, so one. I now know the sequence of that single molecule just looking at it once with over 99% confidence. That's better than Q20 accuracy by looking at a single molecule once. And I can't think of any other analytical technique uh, where you can do that. And obviously, you can then take many strands and you can pile them up in a consensus and you can get higher accuracies. So we've achieved Q50 accuracies on um, bacterial genomes. And then there's also test accuracies where you're asking a specific question. And those accuracies can be, again, incredibly high on our platform. So why Nanopore? Some real world examples. We've spoken about accuracy. Um, another real driver is the output. So on our devices, you can acquire a vast amount of data from a single instrument running one or more flow cells. Um, makes it particularly useful for things like population genomics or dealing with very difficult genomes. The signal is very information rich. Uh, and that includes things like modified bases, like methylation and others. They are inherent in our chemistry, inherent in our signal. We just need to decode them. And we're getting better and better at decoding them. And Stu's going to talk a little bit more about uh, um, methylation numbers in his talk. But I just want to put up a real world example of it being used. Long reads have always been a big draw for our platform. Uh, here's an example of th that. It's an incredibly large genome with a lot of repetitive content. Obviously, a really good use case for nanopore sequencing. We also have a versatile platform, and that means we are very quick in terms of our time to result. We have a very quick library preparation step. The data is generated in real time. And also, an element of that speed is being able to take your sequencer to your sample, and that's particularly important for things like uh, outbreaks and epidemiological tracking. So previous talks, um, you can go to nanoportech.com, the resource center, to see all our previous talks. Um, you could go there and see what uh, I sound like um, under normal circumstances. You can also see a lot of other content from the Nanopore community, um, some of our London Calling talks and, and other NCM content, and also content from the broader Nanopore team. So a couple of intro slides. Nanopore technology, how does it work? Like many other <coughs> excuse me, sequencing technologies, we have to get our DNA from our sample, and that means extracting it, and we have to modify it for our platform. And in our case, that means adding it in these adapters that can like, contain the molecular motor. Once you have your adapted library, you can put that onto a, uh, a flow cell. As you might expect, the flow cell contains many, many nanopores. 
The strand is driven through the nanopore by an applied potential and is moved through the nanopore by that enzyme. And that gives us a signal. We pass that signal through to an ASIC. That ASIC moves it to the base caller. That's a decoder, and we give you the sequence that you're after. Obviously, it's not just one nanopore. We have an array of many, many nanopores in the flow cell, and uh, they all work asynchronously. So they can work on short DNA, long DNA. They can um, pass that strand through, open up again, take another strand. So it really is a very dynamic system. The next introductory slide is really how we concentrate our efforts in R&D. And those are still on the core values of the platform, the accuracy and the output. And also, underlying all of this, we have ease of use, the features, and the robustness. In terms of accuracy, three main things drive the accuracy. Uh, those things are the nanopore, as you might expect. The nanopore really determines the, the chemistry of how the DNA interacts with, uh, with the pore, and that determines our signal and how much information we can get at. The enzyme is really, really important. Uh, that moves the DNA strand through the pore. We need that to be as consistent as possible. If it's consistent, it allows us to have an easier signal to decode. And then obviously there's the decoder itself, the base caller. There are many um, different advances in neural networks and base calling, and, and neural network has come on leaps and bounds in the last few years. In terms of other things that can affect the accuracy, there's uh, parameters that are really do a lot of tuning, things like the temperature, the applied potential, the salt, the voltage. And then there are a number of factors that, unless we keep an eye on, can cause the accuracy to go down. And those can be things like the, um, the capacitance from our membranes can introduce noise through the electronics. The ASIC itself um, has to take that signal and has to digitize and get it into a form that we can read. We need to make sure that doesn't add noise. And the same argument applies to the instrument. Moving on to output. Output um, is really about the number of nanopores you have. And the maximum number of nanopores you can have is determined by the ASIC. And then we layer on the chemistry, then we layer on the membranes, and then we put the pores into there. And those all have yields. The OC yields have been improving steadily, continuous, continue to improve. That's your starting number of nanopores. And then how you utilize those nanopores really determines your output. So the speed is obviously a key factor. The faster you go, the more data you get. Um, you also want to have a well-adapted library, and you want to follow the recommendations on uh, loading because you want to use as much time as possible in a sequencing state and not in the open pores. You can see on this diagram here on the right-hand side that perhaps a third of the time is spent in the lower level, so more output could be gained from this run by adding a bit more sample. Looking at the instruments across our, our product family, we go from the big to the small. We have Prometheum, which um, can run a massive 48 flow cells. Each of those flow cells can acquire up to 3,000 um, channels at once. And then at the other end, we have the Flongle, and that has 126 channels, but is our cheapest flow cell offering. And that allows a really uh, affordable cost per test. So moving on to the platform update. So in R&D, we've been working on the accuracy, not in improving the accuracy in this case, but in moving it through the company and out into the flow cells. Um, as I said, the accuracy comes from the enzyme in the kit and the base caller. It also comes from the pore. And so we have to get those pores into flow cells in high numbers. We've made a slight change to the nanopore. We've gone from 10.3 to 10.4. 10.4 is slightly more accurate, but it's also a lot, of, a, a lot easier for us to handle and get into the flow cells in high numbers. And that's what we've been doing. Uh, so those are uh, now available on Minion, Gridiron, and Promethan. And Rosemary will talk more about that later. Sticking with accuracy, Promethan. I spoke before at London Calling how right at the top end of the accuracy distribution for some older Promethan boxes, you might see that the box is a little bit limiting. And we've got a fix for that. That fix is in the electronics of this board. Um, we are in the progress of contacting customers and upgrading those boards. So do, please do um, look out for this in Rosemary's talk if this affects you and, and keep in contact with Oxford Nanopore about this if you think you're facing this issue. Promethan is an incredibly high output device. So this is a slide from a year ago. We showed an amazing 10 terabase of data from a single Promethan run. So this is six human samples uh, run over a number of days, 
fully loaded promethan, 48 flow cells, uh, medium output per flow cell was 208, and our best was 242. So an amazing amount of data from a single instrument run. Um, I've spoken before about there are a number of different ways you can, you can run this. Uh, you can run it in kind of factory mode to optimize your output, or you can run it in um, a mode that allows you to optimize those long reads, which we know are very valuable to people. It's also very nice when we see some of the numbers that we talk about in these presentations repeated in field, and that happened with Novagene. So uh, Novagene now have the record for the um, largest amount of data off a single promethan flow cell, and that's an amazing 245 gigabases. Obviously, we want to improve that. We want to give you even more output. And one thing you might not know is that Minan actually has slightly bigger wells than Promethan. Promethan, we pack everything together to try and give you a very high density of channels. <coughs> but as, as I've spoken about before, um, we have something called a mediator. And that sits underneath the membrane um, of each kind of nanopore channel. And it's a little bit like the battery life. It's the fuel. And as you pass the current, it gets consumed. Not only does it get consumed, you have to compensate for it being consumed. Um, and Minnow does that, um, but ideally it's something we, we don't want to do. So we've made some tweaks to the Promethan uh, sensor array. We've increased the, uh, the volume of that well, and that gives us more runtime. And you can see here uh, the graph with, with the, the two lines dropping off, um, but the, the high volume is dropping off far less. So here we're having to compensate for that mediated piece in less, because, we, because although we're passing the same current, we've got a higher volume, so proportionately uh, we're, we're changing it less. Um, we had some early batches of these. There are lots more in manufacturing. Um, and on those early batches, we didn't quite have the poor numbers we wanted, but in terms of a per channel output, um, we saw a difference between these two, the baseline and the high volume. And at 8,000 channels, these high volume um, designs are giving us 270 gigabases from a single promethan flow cell. So we've got more of these coming in, um, and please do look out for them in um, the early access programs. So moving on to an instrument. So this is the Promethan P2, Clive announced at London Calling in the summer. And um, we think this will be really popular. It's an instrument that really leverages the cheap cost per gig of Promethan. Um, we know people like that, but we also know that not all labs need a P24 or a P48. Not all labs have that amount of throughput. So we think this would be very attractive to people. This runs two Promethan flow cells. It has two configurations. This configuration is very similar to the gridiron. It has the compute built in. So it has G GPUs to do the base cooling from those two Promethan flow cells. This is the alternative model. This is the, the Solo. And this is a bit more like the classic Minon. Uh, you can connect it to existing compute to do the, uh, the base calling and storage of, of all your data. And uh, as a nice little trick, you should also be able to connect it to a gridiron and utilize the GPUs there. So we think this is, will be an attractive product for those that have already invested in, in GPU infrastructure. So from the big to the small, let's talk about Flongal. Flongal is a pretty simple product concept. It's take all of the expensive components that are in the flow cell and put them in the instrument. In this case, we're, we're putting them in an adapter that connects either to a mid-iron or grid-iron. The flow cell itself is then very cheap. It's uh, just plastic, tiny bit of metal in the electrodes, salty water, some nanopores. And while this gives you the cheapest flow cell offering, it does come at a slight trade-off, and that trade-off is we need to connect the flongal flow cell through to the ASIC, and we do that through these connectors. At the moment, the limit for the connectors is 126 channels, but you can still do an incredible amount of sequencing with 126 channels. So here, um, you can see that there's a community record at 2.83 gigabases um, for a flongal flow cell run. That's better than our internal data, so congratulations to the people that ran that. <coughs> And we're constantly debugging Flongal. One thing that we have seen um, over the last six months or so is that we need to be very careful with power management. And what do I mean by that? Well, we have a membrane that in some ways is incredibly robust. It's been up to space. But in other ways, 
is very fragile. It's only two molecules thick. Um, we put this membrane between two electrodes, and when we apply a potential across that membrane, um, we build up charge on that membrane. And if we do that too quickly, we can pop that membrane. And if you pop it, you will not get any more data from it. So we have to be very careful on how we distribute power across um, all, of our, all of our products and platforms. Now, for Minion, this is also true, but the ASIC is in the way, and the ASIC is there to help manage the power control. So it's a lot more robust. For Flongle, you are connecting the wet chemistry straight through onto, um, onto the instrument. And that means we need to be um, more careful and considerate about how we manage the power. So we put out recommendations on how to do this. There is a software update. There is a slight protocol change. Uh, please do keep up to date with the software, and please do follow the community posts in order to get the most out of your flongle. So I said before, the point of flongle is to make the flow cell as cheap as possible. The flow cell still has a silicon part in it. That silicon uh, doesn't have any electronic components. It's purely there to interface the connector channels uh, on the adapter through to the electrodes at the bottom of the well. Silicon is a little bit expensive. It doesn't need to be there. There are alternatives that are uh, already used in industry that are a lot cheaper and higher volume. An alternative to this is the PCB. Um, I showed at London Calling a proof of concept where we've got a PCB chip with 100 channels, and we've shown some sequencing data. We've got a gigabase um, of data from that sequencing run. And since then, we challenged the team with getting up to 126 channels. They managed to get to 120. And when you look at how difficult it is to root out 120 channels um, from the center of this chip out to all the pads on the edges, um, you appreciate that challenge. It's all to do with uh, manufacturing tolerances, those kind of tracking gaps. We're very happy with 20. We're going we're gonna to stop there, and we're going to um, move towards pushing this through more stages of manufacturing. The good thing is with these chips that they are backwardsly compatible, so a uh, PCB flongle will plug into an existing adapter. Uh, it also utilizes a, a few of the kind of learnings from uh, those Promethean volume changes, so um, we, we're getting slightly more output than you'd normally expect um, from flongle. So the team have managed a amazing two gigabases from these um, PCB flongle designs, and the accuracy looks pretty respectable. Still a little bit of tuning, but uh, we're making good progress on that. Flongle is also a very good platform to prototype on. And one thing we've wanted to do for some time is remove the need for you to flush your flow cell. And this is, this is really for two reasons. One is um, we do want to make things easier and easier for you to use. And the other thing is, that a lot of the product concepts that Clive talks about, such as taking a biological sample and having some automated extraction um, and library preparation, having that on a device and then having to have a human come and use a pipette on a flow cell, it just, it just doesn't work. So we need to get rid of that flush. Um, as I've said before, um, the flush is there because we're using the platform system. And we've been looking at silver as an alternative. So last time I showed some proof concept data, they were very much from kind of handcrafted silicon chips. Uh, we've been pushing up the manufacturing, and uh, we're getting, getting close to manufacturable process where we can produce these in volume. Uh, we'll probably end up doing early access on, on Flongle with these first, although um, it could be something that we look at putting onto Minion in the future. So the last thing I'm going to talk to you about today is the ASIC. The ASIC is the application-specific integrated circuit, and it's really the engine of the Nanopore flow cell instrument. It does a number of things. It defines the maximum number of channels that you have. It also takes the signal, uh, the kind of chemical signal out of those electrodes from the nanopore, and it digitizes that and passes that through to the base caller. It also performs a number of other uh, functions, such as the voltage control and uh, flicking, uh, things like adaptive sampling, all have to go through the ASIC. And a key point about the ASIC is it tends to generate a lot of power. And anybody that's run a Promethean will know if you've got a fully loaded Promethean, um, there's a fair amount of work that the instrument has to do to dissipate that power uh, through the fans and the heat sinks. So this is our new ASIC. It's, it's very small, it's very cheap. It has 400 channels, it's in one buck. So all those 400 channels you, you get up front all in one. It's very low power, 
and that means that it enables a lot of the future product concepts um, that you've heard Clive talk about before. And that low power not only means the instruments can be really simple, but we can also use power from devices such as through USBs to, uh, to power our sequencing devices. So at London Calling, we said that we would be targeting sequencing data uh, by NCM, that's obviously this meeting. So how have we been doing on that? Well, we're doing pretty well. We have managed to uh, build a, a breadboard with the new ASIC in that breadboard. We've used a Flongle adapter um, format. So here we've just attaching a standard Flongle flow cell to the new ASIC. The product won't actually be like this. It'll probably be in a more Minon-like form where the ASIC is in the uh, consumable. That's because the ASIC is so small and cheap and it gives us the most number of channels and the lowest possible noise. And this is really the first look at uh, instrument development at Oxford Nanopore. This is very much a peek behind the curtain. And if the ASIC is the engine of the platform, then this is like taking that engine and strapping it to a go-kart because we haven't got any of the nice things on Minnow, the bells and whistles we've got used to, such as uh, automatic voltage control, the flicking of unwanted strands, uh, dealing with saturated pop channels. Um, this is very much stripped down to the bones. It isn't even running at the right temperature. There's no temperature control on this setup. However, the team have done an amazing job to get some sequencing data out of this. Here you can see a characteristic squiggle. And what is really impressive is, despite it not having its own model and it running at the wrong temperature, the, ac ac <coughs> excuse me, the accuracies of this run are actually pretty, pretty respectable. So we expect these to really go up as we build the instrument, build a dedicated flow cell, and, um, and work this into the next phases of the product development. And on that positive note, I'm gonna say thank you very much for your time and hand over to Stu. Thank you, James. Um, so I'm gonna talk uh, primarily about accuracy, but before I do, I'd like to just take a quick uh, diversion to talk about uh, innovation at Nanopore. Uh, innovation is at, at the heart of everything we do at, at Nanopore. And innovation means change, and change can be disruptive, but it doesn't have to be. Uh, we have a process at Nanopore um, designed to, to cope and, and manage both uh, disruptive changes, which we do through a developer and early access style programs, uh, but also continuous improvement, seamless background changes um, for our broad adoption products. So, so when we're doing a major step change, we'll, we'll typically run that in a, in a developer program. Uh, that means we can be fast moving. Uh, we don't have to understand everything about the product and we're looking for a collaborative working relationship uh, with the community. Um, but then as things become more stable and predictable, we can move those through the processes into our released and fully released phases. And there we have visible lead times, uh, warranties, uh, notifications of changes. Um, we understand those compatibility and of course, full, full technical support. And, and many of those changes can happen uh, seamlessly in the background. I'll come back to those two types of changes in, in just a moment. So if we're gonna talk about accuracy, we need some definitions. Um, and so here's, here are a few types of accuracy that we, that we talk about. Uh, the first, we have the uh, raw read or the, the simplex accuracy, and that's a, a single piece of DNA or RNA going through a nanopore. We're acquiring that signal and we're base calling it. And our, our simplex accuracies are now beating Q20. That's 99% accurate for the R104 nanopore and the KIT12 chemistry. We have duplex accuracies where you're reading both those strands, they're approaching Q30. Um, and of course, importantly with Nanopore, you get the richness of, of base modifications in that signal for free. Um, you have a consensus or an ensemble style accuracy, which is where you have uh, multiple reads, you compile those up. And the, the key point here is that errors average out with coverage. And we're seeing uh, Q50 bacterial genomes from fairly modest coverage around, around 20x. And you get the best result here uh, when you're using nanopore specific tools, uh, tools that understand the data. Uh, we can also have test or, or hypothesis accuracy. Do I have this thing or not? And, and like many people last year, uh, we turned our hand to developing a, a COVID test and our LAMPOR COVID test was shown to be highly accurate, highly sensitive, specific, uh, right up there with the best of the, of the PCR assays. So what affects accuracy? Uh, and James touched on a few of these things. Uh, you have the, uh, the nanopore and the enzyme and, and the run conditions, um, the voltage, the temperature, 
um, the salt conditions you're in, all of those things uh, come together and they're acquired as a signal on the platform. And the platform is really high performance, sensitive, low noise electronics. Um, and that's digitized as a signal. Uh, you then base call that signal and the base caller is a function of the, the architecture and the way you train it. And, and many, if not all base callers these days are, are based on these trainable machine learning methods. Uh, you base call that signal and you get your raw sequence read. Um, and so over the years, we've, um, we've made great strides in, in accuracy. And um, here's, here's a couple of examples of those different sorts of changes that I spoke about a few slides ago. Um, so on, on the left-hand side here, we have the improvements from algorithms alone. These are, these are software updates. They can happen behind the scenes. Uh, you can go back, you can recall your old data. Um, and we see that over, over the time frame of around two years, our accuracy improved from 92% uh, to over 98%. Um, and so that's, as I say, that's a seamless upgrade behind the scenes. You can recall your old data. Um, but we also have these uh, step change improvements. Um, and these, these are changes to the, to the chemistry, things that, things that actually change the, the signal. So, so recently we have um, our R10.4 nanopore and our KIT12 chemistry are changed to both the pore and the motor. Um, and whilst they are step change improvements, uh, they are um, disruptive to some degree. They are just changes in the consumables, uh, barring a few, um, a few things around instruments that James also touched on. Um, you're buying into the technology here. You're not, you're not buying that box, so we are upgrading those, those things. Um, and here we see that with the, the latest chemistries, uh, we're beating that um, Q20 raw read accuracy. Um, and so here's a bit more detail on where we are now. Um, we do have a choice of base callers. Um, fast base callers keep up on all our devices, on our uh, Mark 1C, our Gridiron, our Promethine. Um, you can choose a fast base caller or a high accuracy base caller, which is a balance of, uh, of that speed and accuracy. And then we have the super accuracy base callers, which are right at the top end. That's where you get your, your maximum accuracy. Um, and it's those super accuracy base callers that are beating Q20 for the latest chemistry. Um, of course, you, have, you can read both those strands of DNA. Um, we have this uh, duplex technology. Uh, we are still optimizing this chemistry, but the new kits are duplex enabled. Um, and by reading both those strands of DNA, you can, you can get it up to, um, almost up to a, a modal of Q30. That's 99.9% .9 accurate, single molecule accuracy. Uh, how does that duplex base calling work? Well, effectively you run uh, both those signals through the base caller, and the base caller decodes a, a path in sequence space that is consistent with both of those complementary signals. Um, and that's been uh, in Benito for a while now, our research base caller. It's now in, in Guppy, our production base caller. Uh, it's in a, in a beta release stage. Uh, we're putting together a few more integrated workflows there. We'll flip that to a full release and then we'll be looking at Minio integration. More than two reads and you've got a consensus. Um, so as I said earlier, um, with consensus, errors average out with that coverage. Um, and you get the best results with um, a nanopore-specific tool. In, in this case, uh, we recommend our own uh, Madaka tool, uh, which polishes the pileup, and that gets you up to these uh, Q50 bacterial genomes at modest coverage. Um, best results with the uh, R10-4 nanopore and the KIT-12 chemistry, although R9 and the KIT-10 um, kits 9, 10, and 11. Rosen will talk a bit more about those. Um, pretty respectable results there, too. So, on to variant calling. Uh, we're making a, a, a change to our recommendation for calling uh, SNPs and indels. There are other sorts of variants as well. Um, you have, as I say, SNPs, indels. You also have structural variants, and uh, methylation is also part of this variation game. But just focusing on SNPs and indels, uh, we're now recommending uh, Claire 3, which is a community tool developed by uh, Rubang Lo and team. Um, and that replaces our Madaka variant caller, although you do still use Madaka for consensus. Uh, we have a um, fully, fully supported Epitome Labs workflow there, and we're, we're training models for Claire 3 and releasing those through our GitHub repositories. Um, and, and the reason we've changed that recommendation is, is there are a few features we were considering 
um, implementing in Madaka, but Claire 3 already had them. So uh, why reinvent the wheel? Um, Claire 3 is not the only way of doing this. Uh, the uh, pepper margin deep variant workflow is, is competitive. Uh, if you want to see more details on that, um, Mitten Yane from UCSC is talking uh, in the mini theater. So please check that out. So here are the results uh, from variant calling. As, as I say, there's these various classes of variant. They've got SNPs, indels, structural variants. These are larger changes, rearrangements, things like that, and, and the methylation calling. And we see a robust all-round performance across, across both of these chemistries, both the, 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 the previous R9, R kits 9, 10, 11, and, and the new R10 for uh, kit 12. And you can get all these forms of variation from a single experiment. So you can have a streamlined workflow. Uh, we see that the new R10-4 chemistry, kit 12, is, is um, right up there for, for SNPs at 99.9. Uh, Indel performance, and, and importantly with Indels, we're now evaluating this on regions representative of whole genome sequencing. Other technologies can't necessarily reach the whole genome, so there's no stratifications here. Uh, so Indels now at 89%. Uh, structural variance up at 96%, where we're uh, we're asking more questions about the, the ground truth than we are about our own algorithmic approaches. And the, the methylation performance, we, we think, is the best in the business. So, a little bit more about methylation. Um, we have a new way of doing methylation calling. It, it's called Remora. I'll explain a little bit more about that on the next slide. Uh, but first, the results. Um, the results with, uh, with these new techniques are, are as good or better than, than with the old techniques. And, the important thing with this uh, new method is you maintain your base calling accuracy. Um, um, R941 and the kit 10 chemistry was already, in our opinion, better than bisulfite. That's, that's the only other real method of doing this that's, uh, that's accepted at the moment. Um, but what we see is that with this new chemistry, R104 and kit 12, those results are significantly better than the R9 results. So we see excellent correlation with uh, bisulfite, um, but we've also shown previously that um, our results are more reproducible and we call more CPG sites. Uh, so here is the new tool, it's, it's called Remora. Um, and as I say, critically, you now maintain the base call accuracy. Previously, you had to use a, another model that could call more types of bases, um, and there was a small drop in accuracy for doing that. So now Remora is a second pass through the signal it's, uh, it's negligible compute next to that base call, um, and we effectively annotate the modifications on top of the existing base call. Uh, that's in Benito now uh, for 5MC and 5HMC, and we have a roadmap for all the other types of, of common methylation, including the, the huge family of RNA modifications. Uh, that's coming to Guppy in the, in the new year, and Minnow integration will follow. If you want to um, check out any of these results, uh, there's, there's two things you can do. Firstly, you can, you can buy a Minine. The starter pack is, is $1,000. You can run your own experiments, analyze your own data. Uh, it's not necessary for everybody, so we host uh, open data sets. These are freely available. Um, the best entry point to those data sets is through Epitome Labs, uh, where we have e examples of, of, of many of these metrics that I've spoken about. Um, and tutorials and, and workflows such that you can reproduce those results. So please do check that out. Barcoding. Nanopore barcoding is accurate. It has been accurate for, for several years now. Uh, it's accurate with the, the previous chemistry and it's accurate with the, with the new chemistry. Um, if you're looking for um, single-ended barcodes just on that leader adapter, uh, you can recover over 90% of your data uh, with um, highly, highly specific, correct um, answers. Um, if, you're, if you're willing to look for barcodes on both ends, which many of our chemistries produce, um, you can get up to 99.99% of those barcodes correct. Very, very accurate. Plants. We can do plants. Uh, but sometimes we get a data set where the accuracy is, is a bit lower than we're expecting. Um, and so that's a bit of a puzzle for us. Uh, so our, our first, first port of call is to, is to PCR that sample. Um, and what, what we saw with this particular um, sample is that we recovered um, all of that accuracy uh, by PCR in the sample. So that points us towards modifications being the problem because of course PCR amplification wipes out those modifications. So we can include that uh, native plant data set in our training and we can recover that accuracy um, on the native sample. 
Uh, so we've now added these as, uh, as, as standard. Our base color is learned to flatten those modifications. Um, sometimes you may want those modifications to manifest as, as errors, and I know there are many third-party tools that detect those errors and flag them as modifications. Um, but increasingly, we want to call the canonical sequence correctly, and we'll do modification calling in our second pass with uh, our Remora tool. Alexander Wittenberg is talking in the uh, Plant and Animal Genomics breakout session, so please do check that out. Short fragments. Nanopores can do short fragments. Nanopores have always done short fragments. Uh, the nanopore chemistry will read the DNA or RNA that you give it. Read length equals fragment length. But what we do have in our software configurations um, is a lower limit on the reads that we will output, the reads that we'll write out. And there's various historical reasons for that. Uh, we don't need, need to do that anymore. So now we have a new configuration, uh, which is available on, on request, where we can write out those short reads all the way down to about 20 bases. Uh, we're building that into Minnow as the new default, and we're targeting a release of that in, in the new year. Uh, you see from this uh, DNA ladder experiment in the bottom, the difference between the old config and the new config and we've run a large-scale experiment um, using fragmented human DNA. We've seen over a quarter of a billion short reads. Um, around 25% of those are perfect, and another two-thirds or so having uh, one or two errors in there. So nanopore short reads are highly accurate. So here's the accuracy summary. We have raw read accuracy now at 99.3% greater than Q20. Duplex uh, getting on for Q30. We have SNPs at 99.9, indels at 89, importantly representative of whole genome sequencing now. Um, assemblies, I've not spoke about this this time, uh, highly contiguous, highly accurate um, human assemblies. You can also do diploid assembly. Um, circular bacterial genomes, Q50. Uh, SV detection right up there at the top and methylation for free along with highly specific sensitive test accuracies, um, output records, flow cell records, read length records. You get it all with Nanopore. Um, I want to take a few minutes just to talk a little bit about our software. Um, those of you familiar with Nanopore will be familiar with Minnow, but if you're not, then uh, Minnow is the sequencing software that drives your instrument, it drives your Nanopore sequencing. And for many of you, this will be your primary interaction with Nanopore sequencing. Uh, Minnow is designed to be uh, point and click, but because Nanopore is such a flexible technology, um, there are expert features hidden there just below the surface. Uh, behind the scenes, Minnow is aiming to maximize your data output, it's aiming to maximize your accuracy, and it's aiming to minimize your time to answer. Uh, and that means you can take action uh, as soon as you have the information you need. Um, all of this whilst building a robust software platform suitable for regulated applications. Uh, we have a large stack of work in progress, uh, ranging across the full spectrum of features from production scale sequencing, uh, data management, fleet management, um, various optimizations, um, integrated bioinformatics, so you, so you get closer to that answer in real time, um, robustness, an increasing focus on uh, user experience, and of course, um, looking towards the future, supporting uh, new types of hardware, uh, many of which you've heard about today. Um, of course, we have our portable devices that you can take out to the field, but if your sequencer is uh, in the lab and you are not, we have our app, which is available for Android and Apple platforms, and you can get the full Minnow experience, the full control uh, of that sequencing device um, from over the network. Uh, base calling is getting faster. We are speeding up base calling. And fast base calling keeps up on all our devices, and we provide integrated hardware solutions for that. Uh, the manifestation of base calling getting faster is that the fast base callers are getting more accurate. Um, and so you'll, you'll see that um, as we release those software updates. Um, we're also expanding uh, general support for GPU acceleration. Uh, we have beta support now for uh, Linux and Windows integrated with Minnow. Um, and we have GPU auto detection features in, in progress. We expect to release those in the new year. Uh, we're continuing to look at uh, new hardware, for example, the uh, Apple M1 chips. Um, and we have a, have a decent work stack of speed improvements um, to come, particularly to rein in the speeds of those high accuracy and super accuracy 
base callers. Lots going on here. Adaptive sampling is unique to Oxford nanopore sequencing. That's where you can taste the DNA molecule and if you don't like it, you can spit it out and grab a new one. Uh, there are a huge range of things you can do with adaptive sampling. Uh, we've integrated uh, a few of the simple features, um, things like target enrichment. We've also got barcode balancing in, in progress. Um, for a target enrichment experiment, you can see up to tenfold uh, improvement uh, on target uh, there. For, and this example was a 200 or so gene uh, cancer, cancer panel. Um, we have a first class API that's fully supported. Um, a third party tools can be developed against that. Um, and there's some great examples from the community of those third party tools. Um, Alex Payne and Sam Kravaka are talking about their Readfish and Uncore tools, respectively, uh, in the adaptive sampling breakout session. So, so that's one to watch. Uh, with that, I'll hand over to Rosemary to talk you through a bit more of our products. Thank you. Thank you, James. Thank you, Stuart. Uh, I'm here now to talk to you about how we package all of this amazing innovation that our teams have been up to uh, and release it and, and get it into your hands as quickly as possible. So just to summarize all about the Oxford Nanofor platform, uh, as some of you may know, hopefully it's a scalable platform. We've designed it to be highly accessible. It's very versatile, information rich. And as, uh, as JC and Stu have been talking to you about, it's incredibly high accuracy, high output, and we also deliver the information in real time. Around that scalability, we start from a flongol at sort of 2.83 gigs per, uh, per flow cell, all the way up to the Promethine, the P48, which delivers you 10 terabases in a single run, has capacity for more, more than that, of course. Um, and what we do is we sell all of these products as consumable-only items. So you, you buy starter packs and you get access to the device. Um, this year, we've launched into a relationship with Avantor, so they are now distributing Minine, uh, the Mark 1B and the Mark 1C for us. And we've also now just put onto the shop the P2, and you can see here the prices that, you'll be, um, that those will be available for. On the flow cells, we're incredibly transparent. You can go onto our website, you can see how much the flow cells uh, sell for. And uh, we're also making some changes here. We're adding a 12-pack to Flongol. We're adding a 96-pack to Minine. And for those of you who are Promethine users, you can see that on the Promethine, we are um, radically changing all of the pricing, particularly around those smaller packs, as we prepare Promethine to have more and more users with the launch of the P2. What do these prices mean in terms of the price per gig? Really what, you know, the thing that, the thing that matters to our users. Um, it means that it's incredibly competitive. So you can get, you know, from Flongol starting off at uh, $90 a gig, the Minine then sort of starting taking off at, um, at sort of about 16, moving all the way down, uh, all the way down to $10 a gig, and the Promethine then sort of kicking off at about that $10 a gig mark and moving all the way down to two. Um, so depending on how much data you're generating, what mode you're running in, you are always getting very, very good value for your data. We do have a very versatile platform. Uh, we have a lot of users going, exactly how much do I get? And it, the answer is always, um, it depends. You've got a lot of levers to play with. Uh, you can choose the number of nanopores that you're running, depending on if you're going Flongol, Minine, Promethine. You can, uh, you can choose your runtime. Uh, you can choose your chemistry speed. Of course, we've got different chemistries, the RNA, um, the established chemistry that we've got, the new Q20, they all run at slightly different speeds. Um, you can choose your fragment length. You can sequence really, really short things, as Stu's talked about. You can sequence ultralongs, megabase reads. You can multiplex. You can run different algorithms, different, uh, different analysis software. And, um, you know, we do have a versatile platform, and we've got it because, you know, our customers have got versatile samples, versatile questions to answer. Um, and so the answer always to, to, to customers' questions of what exactly am I getting is, well, let's just talk to you about what application do you want, what do you need, um, and let's get you the best solution to that. Um, and of course, you can track Twitter, you can see what other people are doing um, as they run their platform. We then are an information-rich technology, so we can see SNPs very clearly. We report on methylation, structural variation, phasing, assembly, um, and we do this on any read length from 20, 30 bases all the way up to the megabase plus. Um, so you're getting all of this information um, irrespective of the, the, type of, uh, the type of experiment that you're doing. And we can see that our performance, our accuracy performance, 
doesn't need a huge amount of depth. So our methylation is incredibly accurate, even at 20x coverage. Uh, our SNPs, uh, the, the accuracy of our SNPs increase, increases rapidly, as does our structural variance. Even at low depths, they are very, very, very high accuracy. Um, and all of these developments mean that we can phase, but phase really, really well. We're phasing 98% of the human genome, um, and we're very excited by the applications that that is enabling. So our, ap our applications team do actually work in, co uh, in collaboration with, with users who have got particularly difficult samples to kind of bring all of these, uh, all of these different metrics to life. So you can see things, you know, for example, in Friedrich's ataxia or Prader-Willi syndrome, uh, where you've got these really complex genetic disorders and, and the technology that we have is, is letting users start to untangle that. So you can see not just the impact of SNPs and structural variants, but then how the structural variation adds to that. Um, and, and really, you know, users are really starting to get to know their samples uh, much more intimately. Then regarding the rapid and, and the real-time aspect, of course, every read that comes off a, off a nanopore is immediately available for analysis. And, and this is enabling incredible sort of rapid turnaround times, and it's been crucial in, in the fight against, uh, against COVID. It's really enabled uh, our customers to go out into the field and to get really rapid answers, be it for, for, crop, uh, for crop science, be it um, anything, um, sort of anything where, where the time to result is of, is of the essence. So talking about time, uh, we also then have you know, all of our products have a different time, a different bound in which they operate. So let's talk about our product releases. She, she talked about how we do innovation. This is also how we release our products. We start off with developer phases. We um, put registration of interest forms up, people apply, we pick a few, we, we start working with them. We then open this up to early access, then something gets into fully, uh, fully re into released and then fully released when it's a bit more um, stable, less changing uh, for those of you who are building applications off the Nanopore technology. To give you a history of what this has looked like in the past, you can see that we started with uh, MinIron in 2014 and then slowly added, sort of started to add to that, add the gridiron line, add the promethine line, flongol. All of this has been additive, um, additive work. But really what's driven, truly, truly driven the performance of the platform has always been in the upgrades that we ship in software, in chemistry, um, and, and in consumables. And you can see that here with the developments that we've had in accuracy, say since 2019, where we were sort of, you know, late 80s, early 90s, we've really shifted all of this up and started to deliver accuracies above 99%. Same on the output, users of early minines, they were generating, um, you know, half a gig, a gig, and we now have reports of users with, with over 50 gigs in field from a single minion flow cell. Um, so always what you get when you buy into Oxford Nanopore is, is a journey of continuous improvement. Um, and to really sort of exemplify that has been the accuracy story of the last year. Uh, we started probably at around 97% around a year ago. Uh, we've pushed this 97 to 98. We've pushed the 98 to 99. Um, and with a duplex at 99.8% and, and still increasing, um, we have incredibly clean, crisp data from Oxford Nanopore whilst retaining the methylation, the ease of use, um, and all of the other benefits that come with the platform. So what we're here really to talk about is a whole new platform upgrade. How are we going to take all of the experiments that you're doing and how are we going to shift all of them up a gear into the 99% world? So just to summarize um, what we, what, what's actually involved in pushing Q20 out into the field, where there, there are some, you know, we've got some established, uh, established chemistries. We've got um, our established motor, so that's the, the enzyme that you've, been, that you've been using in all of your kits, be it a kit 9, a kit 10, or future potential kit 11s. We've got an established nanopore, an R9 nanopore. Um, and those are there, we, you know, we'll continue to support users who, have got, uh, who are sort of undergoing all of their current existing projects. We've then brought about some shared improvements that, that are rolling out. We've got a new high capture adapter. We've got the latest algorithms. It's really important to remember that you can take data that you generated two years ago, recall them, and, and come out with a new accuracy number. Um, we also then, of course, have the Promethine uh, M-chip that, um, that James talked about, um, and all of the software improvements that Stuart talked about. All of these are sort of shared things. They, they will impact both the, the, the R9 chemistry and the new R10 chemistry. So then Q20-specific upgrades, what, what do we have? We've got the new Nanopore, the R10.41. We've got the new adapter. 
uh, that, we, that we ship in kit 12. Uh, we have duplex, of course, and we're working on, on making duplex, uh, giving people higher rates of duplex in their samples, but also making much easier to run informatically. Uh, and of course, all of this comes with the Promethean device upgrade that, uh, that James talked about. So that is our new baseline, R10 kit 12. And the previous one was R9 kit 10. So how does all of this impact the products that we've actually got? So let's start off with the preparation products. Uh, you know we have uh, a line, a range of products so that you can uh, prepare native DNA, you can do amplified, you can do RNA, you can do targeted sequencing. Uh, the first thing to note really is that um, that increased um, capture adapter, that, um, that lower sensitivity one, what it, it gives you is potentials for lower inputs. Uh, and we're gonna start that off, kick that off right now with the, with the rapid kit. You can see there that we're getting inputs um, from 50 to 100 nanograms. That's down from 400 where it was before. And our teams will work on, on pushing these improvements across the whole range. I'm now gonna go into uh, what I thought would be the top five. Uh, some of you might notice it's a little bit more than that, but um, the top things, the top kits uh, that we are, that we are in, in the process of releasing. So let's start off with native barcoding for Q20 chemistry. We have a lot of requests for this. A lot of you have been very, very excited about the uh, performance that you've managed to get, um, but you wanna, you wanna be able to multiplex. So here they are, the native barcoding kits. Um, you can see here that we're launching these. These are actually in shop today. You can go and order them. We're launching them in, as sequencing kits. They're integrated, so you've got uh, a, a kit which has got 24 barcodes in, a kit which has got 96. It enables incredibly competitive price per sample. And as Stuart said, we are incredibly accurate detecting the barcodes at classification and correct identification. Our rapid chemistry, that is getting upgraded to, uh, to Q20. That will enable all of you who uh, do not want to spend an hour and a half in the lab. You just want to get, uh, get, get your sample on, uh, on and loaded and sequenced. Um, key benefits here really, aside from the, the Q20 chemistry, is of course that, uh, that reduced input. We have also fixed an enormous amount of other things, like osmotic balances and things which make it more flongal friendly. Um, and of course, it has a fuel fix adapter, which means that it runs, uh, it runs longer without the need for people to continue to top it up. So then let's just talk quickly um, about the, the multiplex kit. Um, so this is really designed around the um, this is designed around our production sequencing houses that have asked to be able to sequence multiple genomes on a single flow cell, on a promethine flow cell. Um, and you've got data here from early validations that have been done in customer sites where people are getting sort of 120 to 150 gigs off a, off a promethine flow cell. Um, and that, of course, has two genomes. Everything's beautifully balanced. Uh, and the target here really is to push that up so that you get 30x coverage per genome um, in, in a flow cell. That's what the team are working on. Automation-wise, the Hamilton scripts are there. Please do come and talk to us if you want to enable two genomes per flow cell, and if you want to talk about production sequencing, we are here to help you. Ultralong continues to be an area of uh, really immense excitement. It's something that d delivers immense value to our users. The ability to go into megabase long reads uh, is something that has never really been done before. Um, we, you know, we're compatible with a myriad of different extraction methods, and right now what we're doing, we're, what we've launched into the community is um, the NEB Monarch kit. We have uh, cells protocol, blood protocol, tissue protocol coming out very shortly. It enables you to do the prep in about a day. We have an extraction central channel where our applications team are there. They're there to listen to you, um, and um, you can interact with them, ask them the questions about your samples, and they are there to help you get the most out of your, uh, out of your experiment. We also have a short read exclusion kit coming. This removes all the short reads from your, um, from your library before you start sequencing so you get better results. Please do keep an eye on the shop and the community early in the new year um, as this gets released. Adaptive sampling, Stuart mentioned, really, really great capability of, uh, of Oxford Nanopore. Our applications team have been busy uh, evaluating different uses uh, of adaptive sampling, and they've, uh, we're launching the reduced representation methylation sequencing. We launched this through something called the adaptive sampling catalog, so we're uploading a bed file and a, and a little uh, info sheet into that. Um, and what the team have done here is done a comparison between running um, adaptive sampling versus a bisulfite sequenced uh, so reduced methylation panel. And what we have found is that 
running it on a min-ion flow cell, be it on a grid-ion or a min-ion, um, you can get through, you can get over six million CPG islands called uh, on the min-ion, um, and that is uh, a superior performance to what you were getting on the bisulfite runs. We then talk about cDNA. Uh, so cDNA, this is a really exciting kit for us because what we're finally doing is pairing up that fuel fix adapter that we, uh, that we have had um, with our cDNA kit. And it's, it's incredibly important because cDNA is all about short reads. So everything's about a KB long. Um, with this kit, with this improvement, we've generated over 160 million reads off a single promethion flow cell and over 20 million reads off, uh, off a min-ion flow cell. Um, other things that are included in this kit are um, we've reduced um, sort of internal priming things that were going on in the kit, in the previous kit. Uh, we've enabled poly A, uh, poly A tail length determination. Um, we've included, incorporated UMIs, um, and this improves the counting. It was pretty good before, but um, it's better now. Um, and we've also got barcoding versions. So the cDNA kit is live in stock today. You can go, you can order it, uh, and it is a very, very exciting kit. Um, and it's, you know, doubly exciting because it enables, uh, really starts really enabling single cell. So um, a lot of amazing work has happened in the community over the last few uh, weeks and months, um, particularly around um, the need to sort of do the artifact depletion uh, that is needed if you're running single cell on nanopore because we sequence everything we're given. Um, so there's been great, great work in the community by this. And what the teams at nanopore have done is taken that, um, those publications, those um, those new methods and paired it with the PCS. The PCS is, is, is better. It's, it's a much, much easier and quicker way of adapting, um, of adapting your sample before sequencing. With these improvements, uh, with this prep, we've actually managed to increase uh, the number of reads that you get off a of flow cell. Um, and so again, this protocol is now in the community. Um, and what the team would love to do is start interacting with all of you who want to do single cell, who want that sort of longer read with the expression that you get with Nanopore, um, and start developing all of the analysis pipelines for the great science that, um, that we're about to uncover with this. We've also uh, released the Midnight Arctic sequencing. We did this over the summer. Um, and uh, what you can see here is it's a very simple prep. It takes about five and a half hours from, from sample to loading your sequencer. Uh, the teams have found sort of very strong performance even at low CTs, and what we've done is we've bundled everything up so you get a pack with sort of flow cells, kits, um, including the NEB kits, everything, everything together, um, and you can start going from about $10, $10 a sample. So finally, on the short side, uh, Stu talked about the fact that we're putting a new version uh, of Minnow out there, which is, which is gonna enable you to, to sequence shorter fragments. Um, this is exciting for, for, many for many reasons. Of course, you've seen that we can generate an enormous amount of, uh, enormous number of reads off promethine, even off minine. Um, but you can do this, you can now have your short read sequencer with the high accuracy chemistry from Oxford Nanopore. So you've got, you know, beautiful, beautiful ability to, um, to sequence short fragments. Uh, but you can still add the methylation in there. You can still have that accessibility, um, portability, real time, all of these additional benefits that you get with nanopore all apply to short reads. Um, and if you think of an instrument such as gridiron, uh, you could be running so your short read, your gene panels on one flow cell, reduce representation methylation on another, ultra longs on something else. So you can actually really start doing your sort of your core short read work alongside all of the new discovery that you get from Oxford nanopore. And uh, then finally, of course, no preparation uh, deck would be would be complete without us talking about Voltrax. So the PCR-enabled devices are currently in the air, making their way to, um, to the Voltrax community. Um, and we are, we are working with everyone to make sure that, um, that they know when their upgrades are all happening. Uh, and we look forward to more talks about Voltrax in the new year. So now onto our sequencing devices and our sequencing offering. Uh, this is, uh, here they are, all of them on, on a table. And again, scalable, accessible, versatile, information-rich, high accuracy, real-time, but um, you can also carry them in your pocket. So um, yeah, really, really great, uh, fantastic range of products to look after. We're uh, honored every day by it. The Minine, going into, going, into this, uh, going into the Minine side there, it's that whole sort of personal, personal powerful sequencer because not only does it start from $1,000, so you can really access it, 
but you get sort of 10, 25 dollars, between 10 and 25 dollars a gig, depending on your run conditions. And, but you can sequence a lot per year. You can sequence hundreds of flow cells per year um, on, on Minines. Um, and you can do anything, on, you know, sort of you've got flongles there, you can do sort of the, the small, small whole genomes, you can do targeted, you can start doing things with Cas9 to do um, targeted, uh, but also with whilst maintaining methylation and, and, and the read length. Um, so many different applications possible, starting from just um, $1,000. And then in comes promethine, in comes the, you know, the, the P2, now able to sort of sequence a couple of hundred flow cells a year if you're running them for 72 hours or so. Um, the P24, you know, that takes it up to, uh, up to the 2,000 plus, and of course the, the P48, even, even higher than that. Um, and the P2 really is around, around that introduction to, to promethine. There are so many users out there who've told us that, you know, they, they really want that, you know, that it, they want to be able to do that expression analysis, that large genome, but they, they want to do it in the comfort of their own lab. Um, and, and they really want to add the promethine capability to their minine ones. So, so P2 is, is a very, very exciting addition there. On the population side, the population scale genomics, um, we now have quite a few of these programs running. Um, and we have a team dedicated to this. So if you are interested in this, do get in touch. We, we've, got, um, we've got a whole team there that are ready to help you set up your automation, set up the whole analysis pipeline, uh, and get you up and running. Um, we're currently sort of a, a, lot, of, a lot of our users, um, you know, some of them with more than 10 installations, uh, are running sort of single, single genomes per flow cells, now pushing into two genomes per flow cell, where you can be getting almost 10,000 genomes off a single promethine per year. Because the prep is so simple, um, a, single, a single Hamilton unit or similar will be able to fill six promethine instruments fully. Um, so it is incredibly, actually quite, um, quite easy to get all of these set up. And you can see there from the size of that room, uh, in a very small space, you can fit enormous numbers of promethines and they're still plug and play. Um, so very, very versatile platform. Uh, upgrades and changes to Promethine during 2022. You've heard uh, from James around these longer run times, extended run times. Well, a long run is a marathon, so uh, bring on the marathon chips. That is what they will be called. They will be launched as the Flow Pro 2Ms or the Flow Pro 12Ms. Um, and uh, you'll be starting to see these hit the, uh, hit the streets in early 2022. A little bit like our, um, our ASIC uh, D ver versions for Minines, it will just become the norm, so there isn't going to be sort of upgrades or upgrade paths or changes. It will just come. It will, you will just start seeing your orders migrate towards this. Um, with more data comes more challenge on the compute. So, of course, we're working, uh, working hard to make sure that we're keeping up to date on all of this. So we are working on A100 towers, uh, so increasing the GPU capability, but also increasing CPU, RAM, I.O., um, as more and more of you write more and more files onto disk uh, at an incredibly fast run rate. So you will see a P24 and P48 tower upgrade uh, in the new year. Uh, and at that time, we will communicate exactly what's going to happen and how it's going to happen. But today on shop, uh, this is what you can start pre-ordering. So you can start pre-ordering your P2 solo. Um, as you can see here, it will not take any space up uh, in your lab. It fits very nicely alongside gridirons or any other Promethine um, or any other compute that you may have. Um, the starter pack is from $10,500. Uh, and uh, we, because we've managed to reconfigure our pricing in our packs, um, we're going to be able to enable customers to do human genomes for under, under $1,000 in their own lab. So very, very excited about the P2. So now let's get into the, uh, into the analysis side. So if you're running uh, our chemistries today, again, you've got the sort of the baseline chemistry, that sort of um, kit nine with uh, kit sort of 10, uh, 11 with uh, R9, and the kit 12 with R10. Um, you're getting um, you're, you're getting actually sort of pretty good pretty good accuracies, be it on the fast hack or sub callers. Um, everything has moved on a stage since uh, since London Calling. Um, and what the teams are working on internally, what our, what our algorithm teams are working on, apart from pushing that accuracy further, is getting everything smoother, quicker, faster. Um, and so their targets really are for the hack, that hack model, the high accuracy model to start keeping up on a Promethine, um, and for the, uh, for the super accuracy caller to continue to, um, to continue to speed up. It's really important as well to, to mention that with Remora, um, that um, developed by, by Marcus, 
Stoiber, uh, with Remora, you'll be able to start getting your methylation at the same time as your base calling. Uh, very, very exciting development. There's so many of you have had to sort of reprocess data, but Marcus has done a really great job there. And then with all of those kind of improvements on the base calling and, and all, of the, um, all of that value coming in from structural variations and SNPs and everything, what the teams are working on is actually bringing this all together because the kind of the, the dream at Nanopore and um, from, from a lot of the feedback that we get, I think the, the, the dream in, in customer land is you just want to load your data set, you just want to load your data and you just want the files that you want to see come out at the end. You don't want to get involved in, in, any, uh, in any of that sort of, um, in any of that analysis uh, rigmarole. So what the teams are driving towards is that ability to load a sample for minute to demultiplex things, uh, for then the SNP callers to, uh, to, uh, to call the SNPs, to phase them, to do the structural variation, to do the methylation, and for something to come out, which is in BAM, VCF, bed file, um, and your fast queues. And that is what everyone is, is working towards. So then into the interpretation side of the data, so um, obviously those are sort of high-level uh, high features. We, we then also have all of our analysis pipelines, all the, all the workflows, so you've got Research software always released in GitHub, Epitome Labs tutorials. This is for people to learn how to use the platform, learn how to analyze the data. But we got a lot of feedback to say, well, those don't scale. We, we want to put Nanopore into production land. So, um, so here come the next flow. Um, and of course, uh, the Epitome click and go. So next flow, these Epitome Lab workflows, they are really built for speed, built for scale. They implement all the same code as the tutorials, so don't, don't be afraid. It's not black boxing anything. It's, it's literally picking up that code and, and speeding it up. Um, and it's sort of really clean deployment um, that you can get onto your, onto your infrastructure. And for those of you who, who just want to analyze something on the fly, we've been working really hard on our Epitome Cloud platform this year. We've regionalized it um, so that um, it's deployed in more areas of the world. Um, which uh, improves sort of connectivity, improves speed, and of course we continue to deliver really, really great content in there. So, uh, just finally to summarise, then we have an incredibly scalable platform. We can detect SNPs, methylation, structural variation. We can phase, we can do assembly, uh, and we can sequence uh, pretty any 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 size fragment. Um, and our accuracy has moved enormously. Uh, over the last 12 months. So you're now being able to generate all of these amazing sort of benefits that you had before with, with Nanopore, with its ease of use simplicity, um, and now you can have data over 99% as well. Um, so now to the slide that um, everyone at Nanopore loses sleep over the release timeline. So um, on terms of uh, sort of the device, device side right now, we're focused on getting the Voltrax out. Uh, very focused also on getting the P24 and P48 upgrades out there so that they can start running the, the Q20 chemistry. Um, and you can see that all of the P2 Promethean uh, tower upgrades and the, uh, and the sort of the P2 integrated, all of that is going to be happening in, in sort of Q, Q2, Q3 next year. Uh, on the consumable side, we'll have the Promethean M chips arriving with us around January, February time. Um, and also we are working on the Flongol R10.4. Uh, on the kits, there are so many, but right now it's the native barcoding kit for Q20. Um, it's the PCS kits uh, going live. It's the kit. It's the multiplex ligation kit uh, going live as well, and the single cell protocol. Those those are the kind of things happening in the next couple of weeks, um, all live already. Uh, on the software side, Remora, Benito upgrades. We've got a focal upgrade that's currently underway. Um, and then you can see the number of features that our software team have to get through is, is immense. But we do have a feature request pin board, so um, please, do, uh, please do give us more features to, to get through. But really, the focus for us is to make our product as simple to use as possible, um, as robust as possible, maintain its versatility so that you can do any application that you want to do, um, and, uh, and, yeah, and work with you, work with the community as we continue to develop it. So, with that, I would like to thank you very much, and uh, we will take it away for Q&A.